Good evening and welcome. I'm Liz Kirkwood, Executive Director of Flow for Love of Water, and I'm thrilled to welcome you here to our virtual Art Meets Water event series in 2021, which marks our 10th year anniversary. Tonight, we will hear from author Lynn Keasley and artist Glenn Wolf and their joint collaboration on the Accidental Reef, a look at the Great Lakes from the river bottom up. Their work is featured as part of this virtual book launch, and we are absolutely delighted and honored to have them as part of our Art and Meets Water series. They will join Flo's Senior Policy Advisor and writer, Dave Dempsey, for an evening of beautiful conversation, and we're in for a real treat. Our mission of Flow to protect our Great Lakes as a shared resource for all is more important than ever before. The challenges we face in protecting these globally unique waters range from safe and affordable drinking water to groundwater con chemical contamination to invasive species to a catastrophic oil spill from a line fire rupture. And the climate crisis continues to exacerbate and accelerate these threats to our waters. But it's thanks to supporters and activists like you, we are making a difference and making significant progress to protect to protect the public's water rights. The governor's lawsuit to revoke and terminate line funds easement under public trust law is just one example of why our work matters so much. Throughout this year, we have been leading with our as a pathway to make sense of our world and to anchor us in our relationships with the water, land, plants, wildlife, and nature as well as our relationships with the human global community. This is in fact the basis of our Art Meets Water program, which is an ongoing series of collaborations with committed and passionate artists inspired by the ability of art to amplify our critical co connection to water and the natural world. As Lynn Heasley observes in the preface, Care and protection of the Great Lakes demand different ways of seeing and knowing. Tonight, readers, new and old, will get a taste of Lynn's and Glenn's work and enjoy an informal conversation. Lynn Heasley is a professor of environmental history in the Institute of Environment and Sustainability at Western Michigan University. Her writing and teaching explore are changing connections to particular landscapes and waterscapes. These include land and water tenure, conditions of injustice and justice, different environmental knowledge in place, and especially our fraught eco-cultural relationships in our human world. In addition to Accidental Reef and other odysseys in the Great Lakes, Lynn is author of A Thousand Pieces of Paradise, Landscape and Property, in the Kickapoo Valley and co-editor of Border Flows, a century of Canadian-American water relationship. According to the author, to author and friend Jerry Dennis, she is one of the few writers I know with a skill to make the traumatic wave crests of industrial chemical pollution fascinating. Glenn Wolf grew up in Traverse City. He studied printmaking at Northwestern Michigan College and received his M his his BFA from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. His career began in New York City as an illustrator for the New York Times, the Village Voice, the Central Park Conservancy, the New York Zoological Society, Audubon, and numerous book publishers. Glenn's mixed media fine art has been shown throughout the US and Canada and is included in numerous private and public collections. He's also been a frequent artist artist in residence for environmental organizations, such as the Great Lakes Bioneers. He now lives and works in Northern Michigan, concentrating on fine art, book illustration, printmaking, music, and as a full-time faculty member at Northwestern Michigan College. His mixed media artwork is represented by Tamarack Gallery in Omina, Michigan. So before we start this conversation, I have to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Dave Dempsey, our host, who's one of the deepest thinkers I know on Great Lakes history, policy, culture, and the environment. With nearly 40 years of experience in pharmacy, he's served 
as environmental advisor to former Michigan Governor James Blanchard and as policy advisor on the staff of the International Joint Commission. He's also worked with several leading environmental nonprofits during his career. And we are so lucky to have Dave Dempsey serve as our policy advisor for the past four years, providing us critical historical insights to navigate today's complex landscape for securing environmental justice and stewardship of our Great Lakes. So without further ado, I hope you have a fabulous evening listening to um, tonight's conversation. I will turn it over to, to Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. I really appreciate those kind words and I'm honored to be able to visit tonight with Glenn and Lynn. I've known Lynn for years from her post at Western Michigan and her work with the US-Canadian relationship, both academically and uh, professionally. And Glenn, of course, is a national, internationally known artist, and I've been fortunate to see some of his work since moving to Traverse City. So I feel like I'm with friends, and I want to just make this a really uh, informal conversation that uh, we can all be comfortable with. And I'll start with, with you, Lynn. Um, I think the first thing that a reader might think of, and certainly when I read your manuscript, I thought of it was, what is the accidental week? What's the significance of that in your um, in your book, and you're on mute. Thanks, Dave. Um, before I dive into that, I, I want to thank you. I want to thank Flo, um, Liz, Diane, Jakob, Kelly, Nate, um, for inviting me to this event tonight. It's a real honor. Flo has a, a, a vision and a kind of community building sensibility. Um, that really impacts a lot of us and makes a difference in the things that we care about, water in the Great Lakes specifically. So thank you for including me in this. Um, I also want to thank the MSU Press. Um, I want to thank um, Catherine Cox and the terrific staff there um, for helping to bring this book um, to fruition during a really hard year and a half, you know, during the pandemic. So I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and Dave, you won't like this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, there's almost no work that many of us do that, that Dave hasn't intersected with um, in his own writing, his own policy work. And so I just want to make that point by showing how when I was deeply immersed in the history of sturgeon conservation in the St. Clair River and the Great Lakes um, more largely, that it was the least surprising surprise of all time to see that Dave himself had co-edited with a sturgeon scientist a book on lake sturgeon. And so um, just to just to make that point um, about what, you know, how terrific it is to be in dialogue with him. So what is the accidental reef? Um, the accidental reef is this humble pile of rocks at the bottom of the St. Clair River near Algonac that no one knew about, but it was an accident of industrial history. I'll do a passage on it that states it more articulately than I can here. Um, but this little accident of environmental history became an unknown spawning ground for Lake Sturgeon. And Lake Sturgeon during the 20th century, um, and especially late 19th through the early decades of the 20th century were persecuted almost to extinction. Um, they were slaughtered in numbers um, that are almost beyond belief today. Um, we're not gonna go down too many dark roads tonight, but, but that's represented in the book. Um, and yet they found a couple of refuges and two of these refuges were virtually unknown to the conservation community, including this very tiny pile of rocks. And then a little farther upstream under the Blue Water Bridge, a much more important um, sturgeon spawning ground that no one knew about and that two people that I write about discovered. Um, so the accidental reef is one of those accidents of history and geology and biology that um, is almost miraculous in a way. Um, so I'll just, I'll, I'll do a passage on that, if that's okay with Dave, if I do a short reading on that. Um, sure. And then um, I'll show, I'll show what it is that we're talking about here. Um, and I'll come back to that. All right. Once a steamship served a salt mine on the shores of Lake Sinclair at Algonac. The mine was just one port of entry to vast Michigan brine deposits. This was the rich, not barren, salted ground on which to build an industry in modern chemicals. 
Herbert Henry Dow, the future face of the industry, chose this salt fertile country well. But long before Dow Chemical was a household name, before Styrofoam or Saran Wrap, Napalm or Agent Orange or Bhopal, a steamship's firemen hacked at the burnt buildup build lining the coal furnace like a thick coat of lava paint and dumped the pieces overboard. His railroad brethren did the same. You can walk along any train tracks today and find small bits or even large chunks of some long ago fireman's face scorching, lung blacking work. Furnaces were less efficient then and the coal less pure in carbon. And so the sturgeon's intricate biological drama collides with other dramas, historical, ecological, geological. This is what we must strain to see in the bottom landscapes of the Great Lakes out of our everyday sight, these collisions and chance encounters through time. Very nice. Um, as I read the book, I was really fascinated by the way you brought out the story of the river with these couple of characters, Greg and Kathy, um, singular people to, to be sure. I'm wondering if you could talk about how you encountered them and what um, they brought to your story. Sure, um, Greg and Kathy, um, Greg Lashbrook, Kathy Johnson are two diver conservationists um, who've spent decades um, devoted to Great Lakes conservation, um, have become sturgeon experts in their own right with a different kind of knowledge that they bring, firsthand experiential knowledge. And, um, and also their, their story of how they see underwater, what they've observed over time. Um, zebra mussel infestations, the round gobies, the recovery of sturgeon, um, and just, just their own sense of wonder, um, their own sense of play underwater um, was going to be a, a single chapter in the book. Um, essentially, I wanted to interview Greg and Kathy, do an oral history interview that helped me, helped read, help readers see what they see and what they experience um, underwater in the St. Clair River. Um, and I also wanted to know more about the story of how they discovered this important reef um, this important spawning ground under the Blue Water Bridge. And so I had imagined one or two chapters um, that would help us see through their eyes. Well, um, Greg and Kathy are fascinating people, but also their story intersects with so many of the larger stories of the St. Clair River and also the Great Lakes. Um, so instead of them being one or two chapters, I took an approach where I braided their professional history and their experiences with these larger histories that I write about. So intense pollution of the Great Lakes in the St. Clair River, the Detroit River, but the Great Lakes too. Um, conservation efforts, um, other kinds of controversies too. And so, so they became a kind of through line for part two of the book. Um, to their surprise, I think later, um, but also because um, they have such a unique perspective. And so um, do you want me to introduce them? I think that'd be great, go ahead. Okay, and then, um, and then I'll come back, I'll introduce them, but then I'll come back to something that they observed in the early years too, which was the zebra mussel infestation. So let me get to Greg and Kathy here for a minute. Um, And I've got a couple, this is, this is just um, to introduce the setting and open it up for them, but it doesn't, it doesn't nearly get at the intricacy of either their story or these larger stories, but it'll set you up for when you eventually read the book or some of the chapters. So this one is from part two. Um, part two is called On Seeing and Knowing and an Underwater Biography. And the first chapter of part two is called Bad Diver. And so this should locate people in the audience here. Should you ever find yourself in the Michigan city of Port Huron, take a walk away from Lake Huron and go south along the seawall of the St. Clair River. The seawall lines and constricts the St. Clair until it finally exhales miles downstream into the open waters of Lake St. Clair. Anglers at the wall might nod at you, then stand aloof. Looking out at the river, you'll probably note the silver blue glitter of water dancing on the river's surface and the skyline of smokestacks a hundred yards across the river in Sarnia, Ontario's chemical valley, a rust red freighter anchored in its harbor. 
But looking into the water, here's what you and I would not see. We would not see the shifting silts and gravels of the riverbed as they expose a slim corked bottle. Rolled up inside is a hundred year old steamship deposit slip, White Star Line number 32616, June 30th, 1915. Along with a perky message from Tilly and Selena, young women on the steamer. Having a good time at Tashmu, they call across the century. Tashmu Park was an early amusement park on the St. Clair Flats at Algonac. We wouldn't see the scuba diver creeping across the bottom of the St. Clair River to the US side, eight pounds of marijuana stuffed in a green tube belted to his wetsuit, or the World War I bomb, the Enbridge oil pipelines, Barbie dolls, dildos, dioxins, ceramic shards, sunglasses, cell phones, shipwrecks, or this, Detroit Archdiocese says missing church found under Lake Sinclair. Yes, a church once went missing in Michigan's most populated region. It seems that underwater realms are human realms too. The water reflects us back to us. As for that scuba diver, there was more action below than international pot running. Where water approached the wall at Pine Grove Park, shore anglers got aggravated by all their lost fishing lures. At times, the site was a Bermuda Triangle of walleye tackle. Here's what the anglers couldn't see 30 feet beneath the surface. Aluminum window screens on the river bottom, ripped and gouged on purpose so the screen would snag their barbed lures. A masked man, dressed head to fin in black, had positioned these scragged screens where he could maximize his catch. He would return for the lures another day. Greg Lashbrook called this person a bad diver. And then I'll move on to um, the reason for interviewing them in the first place. And this is a one page chapter called An Interview About Seeing. Their near lifetime of seeing what most of us can't brought me to the Gregory A.D. Home and Studio, an old converted country church in Lakeport, Michigan, just north of Port Huron. I had to make peace with the sensory overload of their place. A collection of naked mannequins was especially distracting. But eventually we got to the heart of things and considered the following. With respect to the waters that surround and connect us, most humans have great absences of sensory experience, sight, touch, smell, taste, hearing. And now a sixth sense, proprioception, the physicality and positionality of motion, a fluid sense of our embodiment in space. Without our sensory involvement, Lake Michigan is actually alien, at least to most of us, as in we're alienated from its world below. The same for Greg's beloved St. Clair River, home and habitat to him, absent and alien to me. What is it like to swim with a six foot lake sturgeon? To say a neighborly hello to a bristling male round goby glaring at you from the entrance to his Budweiser can, daring you like a chihuahua to threaten home and family. To watch a big, not hungry walleye hanging out near the seawall, taking a little breather from the current, inches away from some hopeful fisher's bait. To discover the largest lake sturgeon spawning site in the Great Lakes, deep, deep in the St. Clair River, a place that even sturgeon scientists and conservationists hadn't known about. What's it like to explore the same river for 50 years as Greg has, so that he knows the river through time and space the way farmers know every changing contour of their fields and woods? What difference does it make that he and Kathy can see the rivers and freshwater seas of the Great Lakes in ways most of us never will? But before more profundity, I still want to know about bad divers. It's terrific. You know, a couple of things come to mind when you read that. One is that, um, you know, the XL Reef is a very nice metaphor for the way in which nature can heal itself from some of the worst damage we do to it. It mm -hmm. can capitalize on some of our mistakes and turn them into positives. And the other thing is, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the last few years, especially when I lived in the Port Huron area, walking along the river. And what impresses me first is how swift the current is there. So I'm, I'm wondering, mm -hmm. Greg, uh, what was, did you ask him what it's like trying to fight that current when he's uh, underwater diving? Yeah, so the, the current is, is part of what makes the St. Clair River an exceptional place. Um, it's a, it's, it's a, um, it attracts a large number of walleye anglers, 
sport fishers and bass fishers, but because of those currents, they've had to invent special ways of fishing in the river and under the water then that strong current, um, and especially with all the shipwrecks and some of the vagaries of the current itself, um, make diving more challenging there. And so one of the things um, that Greg and Kathy were very patient with during our interview process was, was me probing them for the details of what it's like to, um, to swim 60 feet deep, dangerous current, um, near a shipwreck, and then there's a whole bunch of sturgeon lurking around too. And so I finally reached a point where I realized I couldn't narrate that myself very well. And so I, I created a kind of um, a kind of unusual chapter um, that's in small segments that's entirely in Kathy and Greg's voice in which the different dimensions of being underwater are excavated. So um, what's it like to lose control, you know, in a particular spot in the middle of the river? What's it like to have a freighter going over your head and you're, the part of the river you're in is too shallow for safety? Um, so, so yes, so the, the strong currents of the St. Clair River provide a lot of underwater drama that most of us have no idea about. Um, so any divers in the audience would probably recognize some of, of what Greg and Kathy um, convey through the book then. I want to say a couple things before I turn it over to you and Glenn to kind of talk about your interaction. Um, I want to acknowledge that there's uh, very active citizen groups in the St. Clair River, uh, Friends of the St. Clair, for example, that are doing a lot to beautify the, uh, the river and river banks and also to oversee the, the cleanup there. I don't want to forget that. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. um, the other thing I want to uh, suggest is that people can submit questions and we'll um, be glad to answer them later on in the, in the event. Uh, what I'd like to do right now is ask Glenn to unmute and for the two of you to talk about how Glenn took your words, Lynn, and turned them into beautiful art. So go right ahead. Well, hi. Hi, Glenn. <laughs> I also wanted to say uh, what, what Lynn said, uh, Dave, and, and thank you and Liz and, and Kelly and Nate and everyone at Flow. Uh, Jakob, uh, for all this work that you did setting this up and, and for having us as guests. So I think you guys are amazing. You're, you're, the, you're the heavy hitters and uh, it's great to be in the backfield, so. Thanks. Um, you you wanna start and toss something out, Lynn? Uh, Sure, I liked, um, I liked Dave's question the other day of how, um, how you entered into this project, um, your kind of history with us at Western and um, working with some Western students. So maybe that's what I'll toss out to you. Okay, well, I think I was trying to think back and I think, I think we sort of got to know each other via our friend Jerry Dennis and, and his work. Um, we're both fans and I've collaborated with Jerry a lot. And then you invited me to be an, sort of a participating artist with your water humanities class. And, uh, you know, we, we did a couple of events in Traverse City mm. and that were really, really fun and um, involved other writers, musicians, and your amazing students that uh, just set, set everything up. So um, I think that was first. And then you invited me to um, participate in a show at the Honors College down there, along with some amazing uh, Southern Michigan artists uh, like, like Ladislav Hanka and uh, who I'm a big fan of. So that was sort of the starting point. And then you, I think over three years ago, you pitched this idea um, before you were very far along with it, but it was, it, it was such a great hook, the, the idea of the reef that you just explained at the beginning of the, of our, um, of our broadcast here that I, I, I just thought it was irresistible. You know, how could you not, how could you not accept an artistic challenge to depict this reef made out of coal clinkers waste that be, that that saves a species, probably the most primordial primordial species of the Great Lakes, um, also becomes a habitat for a, a nasty invasive that bugs the heck out of everybody, the zebra mussel. So, so that that was a great beginning. And do you want to take people through how um, how you worked with someone that was trying to 
cross between nature writing, um, which is in your metier, which you're very comfortable with, but also, you know, some themes and chapters that were more academic as well. And I, and I wondered if that was a challenge for you at all, kind of narrating some of these stories vis-a-vis -vis your illustrations. There were some that were more challenging than others, but again, I think the, I think I was set up, <laughs> I, I was, I'm happy to get things right when I work with an author. And I think that started when I worked for the New York Times for the outdoor section there. Um, those deadlines were often short and, you know, would, I'd have to, I spent a lot of afternoons coming through the New York picture collection, looking for reference of duck feet and bills and trout flies and what a striped bass look like and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm used to doing the research and, and really enjoy getting it right. And before you were, before you gave me that much written material, you, you have a great way of telling the story. So um, we started, I, you know, it would start as like some, with a lot of clients with me, it's sort of like do a top 10 list or do a top 20 list of, of what's going to be included in this chapter in this artwork. And um, for, for me, I'll start uh, collecting images like on, on the left here is, is, you know, reference that I got uh, on coal clinkers, what the sturgeon look like, what sturgeon fry and eggs look like. Um, what old tankers look like, the map of where we're doing. I have to sort of figure this all out in my head. It's, it's great to do it on Google now. Um, like I said, you know, 30 years ago, I would do a go to the New York picture collection or visit the Times more and look mm. for, for this kind of reference. But you can see on the right there is a typical pencil sketch that's after maybe I showed you a very rough sketch and then you would do some critiques and, and we would I'd hone it down. So this is, you know, sort of a loose pencil sketch. And then, um, well, and can I, Glenn, can I interject with like one of the critique is way too strong of a word, but the, the kind of um, small, small details that we would work on too. And I don't remember if this sketch is one of them, but I think in the first geographic orientation of your first version of our sturgeon spawning site here, um, I think you had emphasized the Detroit River above all else, <laughs> and um, which I thought was funny because that is what the public thinks about when it thinks about this Huron Erie corridor, you know, this long undammed stretch that most of the fishes of the Great Lakes go through because it's undammed. Um, but lots of people knew about the Detroit River. So I remember with that first one, that small modification, can you make the St. Clair River and Lake St. Clair a little more prominent? Those. Those were the kinds of discussions that we had um, because the bigger sketch was always so phenomenal as it was. So it was very small details, I think. And you're so kind. <laughs> it really was small. Making those corrections. Um, should we look at some other pictures? And Sure, sure. And I do, I do wanna show people again um, to imagine this, this, this reef, just imagine a, an Olympic swimming pool um, filled with rocks about this size that when they wash up on the Lake Michigan shore or on Lake Huron or the St. Clair River, a lot of people probably think they're some kind of a lava, but they're really, you know, industrial coal, coal waste from steamships. And so um, the cracks in this coal clinker were just the perfect quality for sturgeon eggs to be protected during the spawn. And so that's why it was a, a small, but a good site for them. Mm -hmm. um. So along with, with the larger full page illustrations that were sort of section and chapter openers, there's a lot of incidental spot art um, of just visiting different different passages that you're doing. So this, uh, I think this is at the reef, a spot illustration on the left is the pencil sketch. On the right is the my inked version um, that, I, that is a pen and ink drawing. What I liked about that one, Glenn, is um, even though I didn't um, didn't do the the graphic opening passage for for our group here tonight, um, the sturgeon spawns are very um, they're very physical. They're very graphic. Um, they're very violent in, in some interesting ways. Um, and so I I felt that you you know you got a sense of that action with this you know with the the larger female and then the two smaller males um, oh. that are going to be jousting for their spot by her. Thanks. Thank you. Um, 
you talked about a food web. So that, that that's the illustration that wound up being on the on the left there. And then some of those um, characters that you were talking about that fish underneath the bridge on the right. Yeah, part of part of, part of um, part of the story that Greg and Kathy opened up for me um, was was the fishing community, um, the shore fishing community especially, and um, that's a really important part of the story because these sport anglers and shore fishers um, they see a lot, and so they identify changes in the river or um, particular polluting incidents too. And, and, um, and, and these, these fishers can be very funny in the sports forums. And so just making sure that we, you know, we made them part of, you know, an important part of, of the river itself. Um, and I, I thought you did a fantastic job with that. Thanks. I see a question in the box, the question box about, uh, says, hi, Lynn, tell us more about your experience in scuba diving in the river. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> so um, I, I would like to answer that question. So um, so I saw Greg and Kathy this summer a couple of months ago um, on the on the Black River, actually, um, for another sturgeon related activity um, that we can talk about later. And so Greg has been offering the the initial site, the coal clinker site is only 12 feet down. And then um, the other one is 60 feet down and dangerous. And so, so Greg has been offering for a long time to kind of haul me down and back up um, <laughs> just to see it for myself. Um, but my one and only scuba diving experience was at a really cold time of year with my husband um, in Tobermory. And we decided it wasn't even for, it wasn't even part of a class. It was like, get a little taste of scuba diving. And um, I, I was terrible at it. And the water kept filling my mask. And, um, and then I didn't breathe. And so Zolt had to like drag me up to the surface because I wasn't breathing. Um, and so Greg said he could take care of all of that. So um, someday, someday I'll go down to the reef. I'll be there to film it. <laughs> Why don't you keep on with your illustrations? This is fascinating. OK. Um, so the, there was another one on. Um, on walleye, they were the subject. So again, and and there were some in the chapter. There were some night views, uh, night imagery of the of the bridge, and sort of you you touch on the the factories that you can see on the other side of the shore. So again, upper left is kind of some of the reference that I was collecting, and then down along the bottom is a the sort of the progress going back and forth. Uh, with with the sketches again, I, I think one thing that we talked about maybe you can mention this on, on the different names that we um, you, you had mentioned for these for the walleye. Yeah. So um, and maybe I'll actually I think I've got that bookmarked here. It's just a paragraph. Maybe I'll I'll give people a sense of that. But that chapter um, is called on naming and knowing. And so in part one of the book at the reef. Um, I take a pretty ecocentric perspective. I'm trying to avoid at first going too much in that human direction because because we always do that. We always we always get into our politics and our cultural concerns, um, our anger. Um, and so I wanted to start under the water with more wonder, but I had to come up eventually and introduce that human component of the more than human world. And so I did that with walleye. Um, because they're so important in the river um, and to the fishing communities, but for their own sake. And I, um, I asked the question, how did walleye get their name? Um, because they have so many different names. And so then we take a little journey, a little odyssey through the walleye and the history of science as it got its scientific name then too. Um, but walleye have a, um, they have, um, a lot of cultural names as well. Dave, do we have time for me to do a paragraph? Um, sure we do, go right ahead. All right, let's see if I can, um, let's see if I can find the spot here then. All right. So that, you know, that idea that, that you start to know the natural world or the more than human world through the names you give it. And then the names you give it have, um, 
have implications for your relationship to that animal. Um, you know, for instance, lake sturgeon would be neme for, um, or neme for, you know, in, in an Anishinaabe language, um, the scientific language has implications for how we relate um, to this world as well. But then there's just the basic naming customs. And so we'll do a, you know, a little paragraph here on walleye. It was very confusing to me for a long time. Um, it seems obvious that underwater fish don't need names to know each other. But above water, knowing begins with naming. Walleye have gone by other names. Francophone Canadians call the fish Dore or Dory. Anglophone Canadians still call the fish Pickerel. Though this is confusing because there is an entirely different fish in the Great Lakes named Pickerel. Sometimes Canadians and Americans bicker about this with Canadians claiming the right to regional naming customs and annoyed confused Americans arguing for universal clarity about which fish they caught. There were also yellow pike and blue pike, both abandoned in fish literature. And walleye was long called walleyed pike even though it's not actually a pike, it's one of the perches. However, the walleye's sleek toothy silhouette is reminiscent of a pike, so it makes some sense that it was called pike perch, except for the separate European fish named pike perch. The other pickerel, by the way, is a pike. <laughs> and so that, that, that really leads us- That up for me. <laughs> and then we, we take that scientific tur turn in the chapter then. Okay, let's uh, watch some more pictures. There okay. we go. Um, yeah, do you wanna, this this was fun. One of the things I love about Lynn is she's just open to uh, stylistic changes, turning on a dime. And in, in this chapter on seeing and knowing, it almost felt like as she's talking about uh, the feeling that the divers have when they're underwater, it almost took on like a, a scientific, a, a, um, a science fiction type type feel. So I was thinking, what if they looked more, you know, mythical, almost like you know Atlanteans or something coming up from the from the bottom, and and maybe the equipment wasn't that important. Um, so that that's kind of where this started, and um, there's there's a circle inset there that it's. Oops, sorry about that. We'll get there. I've lost control of my. <laughs> <laughs> there. Okay. You want to talk about the, the the image that's in the circle inset in the lower right? Which, oh, which sure, sure. I'd I'd love to do that. So, um, you know, one of the things that Glenn and I tossed back and forth for this illustration, um, and it leads in the section on seeing and knowing, um, is how how comfortable um, that Greg is underwater you know, in a way that's hard to imagine. And, and um, it is kind of a home and habitat to him. And he said that he can get, you know, ornery if he doesn't get out regularly. But one, of, but Greg is also an artist. And so he's a collector. A lot of divers collect from the river bottom. Um, so they'll collect all, you know, old bottles, cans, um, industrial waste, um, just all sorts of interesting things. And Greg uses a lot of those, um, those items from the river bottom that he collects in his art. And so one of the things in that inset there, it's a mask. Um, and it was another one of those, you know, weird convergences of um, industry, um, nature and art. And so he would collect lead sinkers, you know, which, you know, which are, um, I call it ecological kryptonite. Right? We don't want lead sinkers in there, but he'll collect all of these lead sinkers and the sunglasses and other kinds of found objects. And for these, he would melt the lead and create these, um, these, these masks, these for, forbidding masks. And so that's one of the masks um, that we're depicting here, just to get at the point of the bottom um, and the kind of art that comes out of that. There's the bad diver that we saw earlier. Um, th this was a, a up close and personal encounter with the sturgeon that uh, Kathy had, right? So it was in the in the first in Glenn's first version of this, um, we we wanted Kathy to have a sense of wonder 
Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll read that in a second. I'll, I'll do that as a passage to the very first version of this. She looked absolutely horrified and terrified because <laughs> it's hard to get the eyes in a mask. And so Glenn recreated it to give her that sense of, of what it's like to swim with a lake sturgeon, that sense of wonder. Um, so that was kind of a fun exchange back and forth. Should I, Dave, would it be okay if I did that Kathy, um, Kathy point of view for that one, if we go back to that? Sure, go right ahead. All right. Um, and again, just a, just a reminder um, that we weave these stories of Kathy and Greg into these larger stories too. So, you know, the, the kind of concerns of the Friends of the St. Clair River, um, the indigenous communities in the area. So, so there's there's more, but um, but in this in this one of the one of the profound turning points for um, for Greg and Kathy was when um, they had already discovered the Blue Water site, um, and they had already spent a lot of time working with the scientists. But then they got a job um, with the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians, um, filming the sturgeon restoration efforts of the tribe, and. Um, the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians, um, they are innovators in sturgeon science because they asked their fish biologists to, um, to adapt scientific methods or to develop scientific methods that were more in line with their kinship with the lake sturgeon um, that weren't so invasive and brutal. Um, so for instance, the Little River Band pioneered streamside facilities so that you know, juvenile lake sturgeon and fry could imprint on the river. Um, and there, were, uh, there are other elements of that too, but working with the tribe had a, had a really profound impact on, on Kathy. And so um, the location is the Big Manistee River. And, um, and I'll just start here. The Manistee Neme population is tiny compared to that of the St. Clair River. But she and Greg found a six foot Neme in the Big Manistee and filmed it in high definition, magical, breathtaking, an honor and a privilege, Kathy told the Manistee News Advocate. Even before they began filming, the two experienced a revelation during a planning meeting with tribal leaders. Here's Kathy's stream of consciousness. And I'm using all Kathy's words here, and it's almost impossible for me to capture her, um, her passionate personality, but I'll do the best I can with her words then. So here's what she says. Never once did anybody use the word harvest. That is always the ultimate goal of the dominant population, to get it so fishermen can catch them, so people can eat them. That's always what it's about. Not just because you need to have sturgeon in the Great Lakes, just because they're supposed to be there and they're part of the habitat and the ecosystem. And I don't know why God put them there or whoever did put them in there, the great spirit or the turtle or whoever did it, but they're just supposed to be there. And I don't need to know why, I just want them out there and not because I need to eat them. So that's how the tribe is, she closes. They were strictly about, let's have the sturgeon back just because we want sturgeon in the river. And if we never see the results in our lifetime, we're okay with that. If our grandchildren know we tried, that's worth it. We're doing this so they know we tried. Great. Uh, by the way, before it's too late, I want to mention we have a giveaway. And um, Glenn, what is the giveaway? I already forgot. Um, it's, a, it's one of the illustrations from the book and it's a linoleum, uh, I call it a lino cut. It's a linoleum black print. Um, it is carved. It's a method of printmaking that you carve on either wood or linoleum with a tool, a uh, carving tool that looks like this. And you sort of sketch things out, carve it away, and then you ink the surface and what's, what's left on the surface becomes a relief image uh, of the print. So I'll, I'll skip ahead to that. Um, and the giveaway is the first person who can correctly answer the question, Lynn, that you're going to pose? Yes. Yeah, so um, the question is, how many grains of sand can you hold in your hand? Let's call it sand dune sand. And if anybody wants to, to play along, you can throw out your guess in the Q&A box, correct? Correct. Right. And the closest person will, will get the print. Mm -hmm. And you'll be very lucky if you get it. It's fantastic. <laughs> So why don't you continue with the uh, well, interaction? Someone nailed it. No way, someone got it right away. Ah, all right, okay. Wow. 
I should have picked a harder factoid than um, Glenn and I did a chapter together that are all factoids, all numbers. And so we just picked one. Who got it, by the way? Uh, Catherine Cox. Oh, Catherine. <laughs> Catherine's my editor in chief. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Catherine's at the MSU Press. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah. So why don't well, you continue um, showing how this developed? Or... Okay, um, well, there's, what would you like to talk about next, Lynn? There's, we've, we've, there's yeah, a- Yeah, so um, I, I think, I think we should go to that part three. Um, so if the, if the group knows that, that the book builds um, from that kind of below water ecocentric perspective for a few chapters up to that braiding of um, environmental issues, um, industrial pollution, sturgeon conservation, Greg and Kathy's story. Um, and then part three is, is, is the one I've been building up to, which is the, the great dilemma of the Great Lakes and, and, and um, the natural world more generally, actually, which is um, the paradox of abundance. And it's what I, you know, and it's, it's I, almost, um, I almost wrote a slightly different book called The Paradox of Abundance. Um, and the, the argument or the historical idea is the very fact of a tremendous abundance of resources has almost guaranteed the decimation um, and the intense extraction of those resources before people can protect them in time. And so the Great Lakes are not immune to that. Um, and so there are a few chapters in part three where I'm trying to, to um, get my own arms around and maybe help the readers to see the magnitude of that abundance, but in a way that's comprehensible. Um, and then to just face head on, you know, that problem of abundance. Um, and so the Great Lakes, um, you know, we've got, you know, steel, automobile, chemical, salt, um, you know, soil, trees, water, um, you know, we're at constant risk because of that paradox of abundance. And so I think one of the more challenging chapters for me to work with Glenn on had to do with this, this weird salt mines and iron ranges chapter and extraction index. And um, what I was trying to do was take the Harper's index, um, you know, and no one can do it like Harper's, but to take the way that they have 40, a list of 40 entries that all end in a number. Um, and it's brilliant. It's a brilliant format. It was, um, it was pioneered by, by Michael Pollan, um, you know, a writer many of us know, but I wanted to adapt that Harper's index to the idea of extraction, both in the Great Lakes and globally. And so I applied the Harper's index to four, uh, you know, four um, what other people call natural resources that we consider just part of nature, but um, trees, um, salt, iron, and sand. Um, but how to do an illustration that's just all about extraction. And so maybe we'll, um, so you can see the format there with trees, each one of those entries ends with a number, you know, so um, the age and years of Pando, who's the, you know, the oldest organism, you know, oldest tree organism in the world. So Glenn, if we want to show how you, how you navigated what I thought was going to be a really hard illustration to come up with. Well, um, again, this was, it was, and this was sort of generated from your, from you verbally. I'm, I, I didn't really see these lists until the, till the very end. But what I love about them now after doing the artwork is that they're the juxtaposition, you know, it's like they're, they're poetic in, in your arrangement of them. You know, it's almost like they could be, you know, taken for song lyrics, rap lyrics or folk song mm -hmm. lyrics or something. And, and just the way you mix things up, that, that's what I really, I just had so much fun. <laughs> I had no, this was the one image where I literally had nothing in my mind on how you would do this. Um, oh, and we should tell people too, that around the same time that I was laboring over these lists, um, I read a poem in Orion by Kwame Dawes. And I knew, I knew I, I had to have that poem integrated somehow in the illustration. Um, so Kwame Dawes gave, gave us permis permission to take a stanza of his poem. Um, and Glenn, do you wanna read it? Read the poem, the, the stanza before explaining the illustration? Sure. Um, the, the excerpt it, uh, that I, I wrote out was the land is to be leased to the capital of excavators. 
searching and then harvesting the minerals from the red earth of this deep green country. The way machines with the maw and teeth dig deep through the underbrush, the tongue for the soft belly of ancient tender clay, lifting the scooping of green and dripping red against the sky. So those, you know, so, so such beautiful words that it, it was, it was not that, <laughs> it was challenging to get the right image, but not that hard at the same time. And so each of those, each of those panels represents one of the resources in the index then. Um, right, so, uh, yeah. Salt, sand, trees, and iron, iron mining. Um, and in all of those areas, we, um, we're still undergoing intense extraction. Um, so for instance, in Wisconsin, you've got this quality of sand um, that's called frac sand because it's such a high quality of quartz um, that it's used for fracking in, in the region. Um, and it's sent all over too. Um, so it's not as if the extraction ended with the great white pine cutover, it's still happening today. Um, so there's some, there's some pathos too. Ah, here we go. I'm not trying to rush things. I'm, I'm watching our time here. Okay. Are, are we, do you have to be careful, Dave? Yes, we'd like to get over a little after 6.30. Okay. Um, should we talk about the cover? Sure. Painting. Um, again, what, what, what's fun about Liz, uh, Lynn, is that she, I, I'm kind of known for my pen and ink illustration style, but I'm also a printmaker. So she said, well, let's do, let's do a print for an illustration. And then the imagery from that print became uh, what we decided might be a, a nice image for the cover. So we started this dialogue back and forth of how, what the cover might look like. And she's also a fan of my mixed media work, which is quite different than my pen and ink work. So this was sort of the first sketch. Um, I decided to do a color painting in acrylic and mixed media on wood. So this is, this is how it began with a black uh, underpainting, uh, black gesso underpainting. Then sketching out that idea on the, was, uh, that I sketched, that I just showed you a little while ago in white pencil over that black underpainting. Then I'm, I like to use, I like to mix things up sometimes and use a little bit of collage. So I started collaging elements of uh, Italian marbled paper in uh, as, as a base for the drawing and then worked acrylic paint on top of that. So it was kind of a push and pull back and forth dialogue. Uh, and I think some people are, are kind of afraid at this point because <laughs> they're not sure where the painting's going. And Lynn, you were really game. <laughs> you were very courageous in just watching the process. I don't know if I scared you at all, but. Um, no, I just I just sat back and enjoyed the process um, because I know so little about the layering, and um, so I felt like I learned a lot. Well, and that, and that so was kept going, yeah, till we got there. Yeah, beautiful. It is beautiful. One of one of the things that I, I loved about the painting, I, I've got a lot of friends and colleagues who are ecologists and scientists of one kind or another. Um, so, you know, I've got a fish biologist in my unit and a wetland ecologist too, and um, and so there, you know, some of those creatures inadvertently, Glenn included some of the, you know, some of um, some of their creatures that they study too. Um, and then, of course, for all the anglers in the audience, you know, that Glenn is very, um, he's, an, he's an angler himself, and so he depicted that. We have a couple of comments that I'd like to read. Um, Anne-Marie Uman says, I love this idea of sturgeon science. Natalie Tomlin says, Lynn and Glenn, no question, just thrilled to see your work as I am from Port Huron, born and raised. Oh. And then some, some guy named Jerry Dennis says, uh, wonderful cover. Can you tell us about the award it won? Uh, yes. Well, actually, not not an award. It was included in uh, the American Illustration Annual online this year. Um, not the cover, but the the black and white lino cut illustration that um, that this sort of the idea came from. 
So that was included in uh, American Illustrator's Annual this year. So that was a nice, a nice honor. I should mention Jerry Dennis wrote the forward to this book too. So that's, that's an important contribution. We've got a couple of minutes, but I, I guess um, if there's no more questions. Perhaps both of you can give us a little bit of um, information about uh, where to get the book and any upcoming events that you have and where, what your website is and so forth. So I'll start with Lynn. All right. Um, so the the book has had some um, some warehouse distribution issues, but I think that those are solved now. So the book's available directly from the MSU Press if you go to their website. It's also available um, at Horizon Books. They have 20 copies now, I think. Um, I think that that's what they confirmed. In terms of events, I have um, two podcasts and um, an interview, a radio interview, um, but none of those have a firm scheduled date yet. And so I'll let Flo know um, when those are actually on the books then, but they'll be in September and October. Can we give a shout out to our friend, Jerry Dennis too? Oh my gosh, yes. So Jerry, um, Jerry and Glenn have a book coming out September one called Up North. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. So it's a compilation of, of um, Jerry's essays, um, some of them dramatically changed and some new, and then Glenn did the artwork for it too. And I, I had the, um, the honor of, of reading it fairly recently. Um, and really, I just, just want to take it with me traveling, you know, anywhere that I go in the Great Lakes or beyond, I want to have that book with me and, and, and read an essay a day. It's quite, quite beautiful. Yeah, up north in Michigan, it's called in, it's, it's a portrait in, in seasons. Of, of Michigan. And I think it's a, a tour de force for Jerry. It's just beautiful writing. Really didn't need artwork. You know, he just like, let me come along for the ride. <laughs> You've had a great partnership with Jerry over the years. Yes, it's been fantastic. Um, well, I just want to close by thanking everybody. I want to make a pitch for the book. I, this is a true original in Great Lakes literature. Um, as far as I know, this fantastic prose and then the partnership with uh, Glenn on the art is uh, just a, a, an original. It's unprecedented and it's actually well worth picking up and reading. I think you'll be very happy and entertained as well as learning a lot about uh, the Great Lakes from the bottom up. So I want to thank Lynn and Glenn for um, taking time out to read from the book and tell us about the creative process. I want to thank everybody who's on the on the webcast or the webinar for joining us and hopefully if you have questions we'll be able to take them afterwards and follow them to Lynn and Lynn. So thank you, everybody, and have a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, folks. Really thank loved you. it.